This lesson is intended to provide a brief introduction to linear mixed models, also known as multi-level models. These models are specialized tools with a lot of flexibility, and I am not going to go into any of the specialized uses here. I won't be covering things like covariance structures or the actor-partner interdependence model. The point today is to get you comfortable with the basic idea of a linear mixed model on an intuitive level, so that you will be ready if and when you want to learn more about the details. The first pass minimal ideas in this lesson are sufficient for some of the more straightforward use cases anyway. This lesson assumes that you already have a robust understanding of linear regression, including especially linear regression models with interaction terms and how they compare to similar models without interaction terms. If you have doubts about those concepts, I strongly encourage you to watch three of my other video series first, the conceptual introduction to linear regression, practical demonstrations of linear regression, and interactions in linear regression models. Let's think about four examples of how observations can be grouped in research designs. Suppose you're interested in the relationship between stress and test scores for students, so you carry out some testing sessions in six classrooms at a school with 25 students per classroom for a total of 150 participants. You could just look at the correlation between self-reported stress and test scores, but what if two of the classrooms just have low overall test scores? And what if one of those two happens to have had something stressful happen on the day of the testing? You'd end up thinking that half of your low test scores came from stressed out kids when it was just a coincidence. The problem is that students in the same classroom are not independent observations because they all take the test together. Observations in this case are clustered by classroom. The research design has a hierarchical structure with students within classrooms. Now suppose you're a couples researcher and you're studying whether people who perceive themselves as more similar to their partners report more commitment to their relationships. You sample 60 couples for a total of 120 participants. Everyone reports their perceived similarity and commitment, but some couples actually are more similar to each other. So members of the same couple will sometimes have matching similarity scores because they're both observing the same real similarity. Do you have 120 observations or just 60? Yet again, the issue is that the 120 observations are not independent. Observations are clustered by couple. The research design has a hierarchical structure with individuals within couples. Now suppose you have a cognitive experiment where you're testing valence bias in a lexical decision task. That is, participants make a quick word-nonword -word decision, and you're interested in the word trials, where the words are positively or negatively valenced. Each participant goes through 100 of these trials, 50 positive and 50 negative. If you have 65 participants, then you really have 6,500 observations because each participant provides 100. These 6,500 observations are not independent, though. For example, some participants may show a large reaction time discrepancy between positive and negative stimuli, and other participants may show no discrepancy at all. Observations are clustered by participant. The research design has a hierarchical structure with reaction time trials within participants. Last example. Suppose you're studying explicit attitudes toward five specific attitude objects, such as five specific religious groups. Each participant reports their attitude on a scale from negative to positive toward each religious group in a random order. Maybe those groups are Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, and atheist. You're interested in comparing the overall attitudes toward each of these groups. If you have 100 participants, then you have 500 observations, 100 for each target group. Observations, though, are clustered by participant. The research design has a hierarchical structure with target group ratings within participants. These examples fall into two basic categories, both common in psychology research. The first two examples had groups or clusters of participants. The second two examples were repeated measures experiments with multiple observations per participant and the intention to compare those observations to one another directly. At first glance, these situations might seem pretty different, but participants being tested in groups and repeated measures experiments have something in common. Both create non-independent observations. 
This slide is copied directly from the Practical Demonstrations of Linear Regression video series. You may recall that ordinary regression models make the assumption that observations are independent, the distribution of residuals is close to normal, and all residuals come from the same distribution with constant mean and constant variance. In those videos, we looked at plots to evaluate the assumptions about the distribution of residuals. But I also said, before you see any data at all, you should already have information about the first assumption. That is, you should already know something about whether the observations are independent based on how you designed the study. You should know whether there's some design feature that leads participants to influence one another or to be simultaneously influenced by the same circumstances. Today, we're talking about models that avoid the assumption that the observations are independent. The example studies I mentioned a moment ago were all cases where the observations are not independent, and the researchers know that the observations are not independent. And you could make a categorical variable to identify the observations that depend on one another. In the first example, that variable would be classroom, and it would have one category for each classroom where testing was done. In the next example, it would be couple, and it would have one category for each couple, a huge number of categories. In the last two examples, the grouping variable would be participant, and it would also have a large number of categories, one unique category for each participant who completed the study. These grouping variables are the key to linear mixed models. You might want to use a linear mixed model if you have a grouping variable like this, and you know that you need to deal with it somehow, but you don't need to make explicit comparisons between individual categories of this grouping variable. So what could you do with a grouping variable like this? Let's suppose you have a data set where each observation is one row, and the grouping variable is one of the columns. You could simply try to include the grouping variable in your model as a predictor. In the example where students were nested within classrooms, you could add a factor representing classroom as a predictor, shown here in red. In the example where each participant evaluated five religious groups, you could set up your data so that each rating was its own row, with a factor representing target group to distinguish the five rows that exist for each participant. Then you can introduce a factor representing participant to the model as an additional predictor. This factor would have one level for each participant. You could maybe even let this grouping variable interact with the variables that you actually care about. What would happen if you did let it interact? Think about that for a moment. You should have an intuitive sense of this after the lessons on interactions and regression models. You would end up with a model that could give you a separate conditional slope for each level of the grouping variable. What about if you didn't let the grouping variable interact with the main variable of interest, like on the top of the slide? Think back to the videos comparing interactions to main effects. If you omitted the interaction term, you would end up with a compromise slope across levels of the grouping variable. That is a compromise among all the conditional slopes that you would have gotten with the interaction. These approaches would help deal with the unusual structure of the data, but they have two big problems. First, the grouping variable might have a ton of levels, a ton of categories, so the resulting model would be very complex and might not even be possible to fit. Second, there is still the assumption of independence, and we're not explicitly dealing with that in either of these cases. The model doesn't know that the grouping variable has special implications for the independence of the observations. So actually, you have two reasonable options in these cases. Use something called a random intercept, or do that and also include random slopes. These two options are sort of like including the grouping variable as a main effect versus adding interactions along with it, except that the random intercept and random slopes avoid the two big problems I described a moment ago, the huge number of categories and the assumption of independence. These options estimate the regression model within groups, that is, within levels of the grouping variable. This might be within participants in many cases. The first option, which has just a random intercept, forces the slopes in the regression model to be the same within each group. So the only thing that differs between groups is that some have higher overall values of the response variable, and some have lower overall values of the response variable. This is typically framed as each group having its own intercept for the regression line. The lines start at different heights, but they're at the same angle. They have the same slope. 
It's called a random intercept because the model will treat the varying intercepts as the result of a random process. There is some mean intercept and some variance among the intercepts, and each observed group is presumed to be the result of a random draw from that distribution. The second option, random slopes and intercept, allows the slopes to vary by group too. This is typically framed as each group having its own intercept and its own slope for the regression line, which is why it's like having an interaction with conditional slopes for each group. But in this model, the intercept and slopes are treated as the result of a random process. There is a mean intercept and a variance among the intercepts, and for each term in the model there is a mean slope and a variance among the slopes. And each observed intercept and each observed slope within levels of the grouping variable is the result of a random draw from those distributions. Some textbooks and classes will also discuss the possibility of fitting random slopes without a random intercept, but that is never a good idea except in very contrived examples. It's not really worth talking about. This probably all sounds a little too abstract at the moment, and that's okay. I'll make it more concrete with some visualizations very soon. But first, a note about terminology. This lesson covers linear regression models that include random terms, random intercepts, and or random slopes. In addition to the usual fixed terms like the regular regression intercept and slope you already know about. These models with random and fixed terms are called linear mixed models. The mixed part of the name comes from the fact that there are random terms and fixed terms instead of just fixed. Sometimes linear mixed model is abbreviated to LMM. These models also go by several other names. A linear mixed model is also called a linear mixed effects model, a multi-level model, sometimes abbreviated to MLM, or a hierarchical linear model, sometimes abbreviated to HLM. These are just different terms for the same thing. A quick aside, the last term, hierarchical linear model, is potentially confusing because it sounds a lot like hierarchical linear regression, which is just a fancy name for comparing ordinary regression models with more and fewer predictors. That is, if you have a regression model with two predictors and you want to compare it to another regression model that has the same two predictors plus an additional predictor for a total of three, you might call this whole process hierarchical regression. But I generally avoid using both of these phrases. I don't say hierarchical linear models to refer to linear mixed models, and I don't say hierarchical linear regression or hierarchical regression to refer to ordinary regression models that simply share predictors. These phrases sound too similar despite meaning entirely different things, and it gets in the way of clear communication. 